What's it going to be like for you to have, you know, the the fans, you know, packed house for this pay-per-view uh, this upcoming Sunday? You know, I mean, it's one of those things that when the pandemic started, we never we never stopped working. We just we just worked in front of no people, which was very strange because I remember some of the the uh, some of the other guys on the show were like, oh, "I feel bad for the young guys working in front of no people," and I was like, "Young guys, screw the young guys. They feel bad for me. I haven't worked <laughs> in front of no people since I was 19 years old, and it was just such a weird dynamic and." Thankfully, in about September, we started having smaller crowds, you know, the 500s and the 800s and maybe creeping up to 1,000. But now to be uh, here in Jacksonville uh, with a full crowd on Sunday, and it's pretty much sold out at this point, it will be sold out on Sunday. Um, it's just one of those things where you just remember how important a live crowd is and a full, legit, screaming, yelling, energetic live crowd. I mean, that's kind of the... The, the, the third element to wrestling, the, the, the hidden element to wrestling of what we really do this for. So we're really excited, man. It's just another step of getting back to being on the road again and, and just being back to where we were, you know, a year and a half ago. Yeah, no question, Chris. You know, what did you, you know, I want to follow up on that for a second. What did you learn, you know, in, in working with, the, as you mentioned, you had to go back to when you were 19 wrestling in front of no fans, no crowd. What did what did you learn as a performer, as a wrestler uh, during that time where there, where there were no fans in attendance and then sparse fans at 500 or 1,000 initially? You know, it's not so much what I learned. It's what I, you know, it's what I remembered, once again, just how important a crowd is because a lot of what we do – is just based on crowd reaction. It's very much like being an improv comic or being, you know, a jazz musician where you kind of follow what the crowd is doing. And if they like something, you give them a little bit more of that. If they don't like it, you switch directions. And without having the crowd, it was much more regimented and much more, I guess, like filming a movie, for example, where you're doing a fight scene and you have no idea how people are going to react to that scene until you know, three months later when the movie comes up on the, on the, on the big screen. So the live element, which is, is what was missing most, the, the electricity, the connection that you have with that crowd, which takes you in different directions. And they're always different in every city. And we miss being on the road, too. Jacksonville was a great city for us as our home base for the last year and change. But, you know, if you're in Miami one week, in New York City the next, in Los Angeles the next, in Toronto the next, Every crowd is a little bit different, so you structure your performances accordingly. And when that all went away, it just became a lot more sterile. It was still, you know, vibrant and important, and we did a lot of great stuff. But when you take out that, like I said, kind of that hidden uh, element of the crowd, it really changes how you put together your performances in and out of the ring. You know, Chris, is that an instance then where you're not getting that instant reaction to where then maybe you're you're hopping on social media after a match, you're seeing what maybe some of the wrestling message boards are saying, are you getting the reaction from what worked, what didn't work, since you're not getting the instant reaction from the crowd in the building at the time, are you looking for what the reaction was after the match is done on social media? Yeah, I mean, you know, you always can kind of pay attention to that. It does give you a barometer. But especially over the last year, social media became more of a negative place, and everybody, uh, there's a lot of, you know, kind of complaining and, and, and holier than thou, know it all type stuff. You can still get that type of information. But where we really got our information and it kept a big eye on it, we actually did really well, at, well for our show, was, it was for the ratings. And gotcha. looking at the various demographics and what quarter hours are doing big numbers and what the swing is. Okay, well, Jericho is on, and every time he's on, the numbers are up, for example. Or if so-and-so is on and every time the numbers are down, maybe you want to put that person in a different position or give them a break the next week. So that became more – our boss, Tony Khan, is a very much a numbers and an analytics guy. And that came in very handy for us at AEW. That was basically our biggest barometer as to what was popular and what wasn't, is just looking at those demographics and those numbers on a weekly basis. We're talking to Chris Jericho, big pay-per-view event this upcoming Sunday night, third annual Double or Nothing. We'll get into his stadium stampede match, which is going to be fun as well uh, down in Jacksonville. You know, Chris, I wanted to ask you about, you know, AEW, their growth. Um, You know, you were there initially. 
you know, you came over, you joined AEW. Obviously, we know the the successful, you know, other uh, wrestling, uh, you know, wrestling uh, programs outside the WWE, WWF, like the WCW at times. What about the growth of AEW here over the last year and a half, two years? It's really exciting, and it's one of the reasons why I left WWE to come to AEW was the challenge of building a brand new company. And I knew we had a chance to really do something because of the roster that we had, the television that we had with TNT and now TBS, and with the the passion, uh, and, you know, and, and and the financial backing from the Khan family. So it really was uh, kind of one of those things where all the planets aligned. And um, I don't think this could ever really happen again. We came out of the gate so strong. And the crazy thing is, we have been a, a company without fans, you know, or, or a lockdown situation longer than we were before. I think right. we were only up and running for four or five months beforehand. And, and we were steamrolling it as far as, you know, our first New York show was going to be, the New York market show was going to be at the Prudential Center in Jersey, which I think 12,000 tickets sold. And we were two weeks away from that show before we got locked down. So we were doing some really big numbers in the arenas and on television. So um, I think it's really exciting to see now that we're getting ready to go back on the road in July, if we can pick up that momentum, because television wise, the numbers are there. I mean, we're the number one most watched show on cable a few weeks ago. Um, we just need to, to, to get that excitement back into the arenas and buy our initial ticket sales for the first few shows in July that we put out there. Um, it seems like the, the, the desire and the interest and the excitement is there again. So it's really cool to see this company begin. It was really cool to see the company uh, almost flourish in the middle of these very strange times. But now that we're kind of at the, you know, at the end of it, hopefully we can get back to, to having this huge momentum and continuing to build uh, our show into the, uh, you know, it, we're already the coolest wrestling show in America and we're you know, working on to, towards building that to the biggest one as well. You know what, and, and we're talking to Chris Jericho, AEW, big pay-per-view event uh, this upcoming Sunday. And Chris, correct me if I'm wrong, and you know, I, I think you, you mentioned that about how, how AEW has flourished. I, I think one of the big reasons why you guys have flourished is because of how creative you are as a wrestling entity, um, you know, how, you know, as, as your program is, you know, you push your, you know, you push the boundaries, um, you know, it, it's not stale, it's fresh. I think the creativity from AEW, I think that's where the wrestling fan and the, the wrestling entertainment fan is really kind of latched on to AEW. Well, yeah, because people can see it's different. There's a different vibe to it. Um, there's a lot more of a creative element to our shows. Uh, WWE is very much written um, and kind of approved and over-approved, and that's fine. That's the way they do things, and it's very successful. One of the things I love about our show is, is we're pretty much everybody's not in charge, but everyone has the option to be as creative as they can. And, you know, when we're putting together our matches and our promos or even – even our storylines. I mean, I have a huge input in the storylines that, that I'm involved with to the point where I pretty much know what I'm doing for the next six months. And things will always morph and evolve, but the, the overall connecting the dots from this event to that event to this thing um, is, is all there and kind of planned out. So it gives such a different dynamic in AEW from, from other companies because we're pretty much in charge of what we do. We know where we're going, and you can plan accordingly. And everybody's character is you know, the, the character that they want to play, which always makes things more successful uh, and better when you're doing, you know, this performance of something that you believe in and you can really feel and you can speak your words, not somebody else's. We're talking to Chris Jericho, AEW, third annual Double or Nothing pay-per-view event this upcoming Sunday night, holiday weekend. Chris, tell us a little bit about what should we expect here from the stadium stampede match uh, between your group and and the other w- with the inner circle, what should we expect from this match on Sunday night? It's interesting. So last year we had double or nothing, and it was supposed to be in Las Vegas. I think we even sold out that show. Of course, like we mentioned, the lockdown happens, and we're kind of uh, in Jacksonville, stuck in Jacksonville for lack of a better term. And we're doing this big pay per view once again in front of no crowd, no people. What can we do uh, to try to, to make it a little bit different? And then we came up with the idea of the stadium stampede because our venue that we work in is connected right to the TIAA stadium where the Jaguars play. So we walked in there and just looked at this vast, empty stadium. What the hell are we going to do in here? And we basically created one of the most critically acclaimed best matches of last year 
that drew a huge pay-per-view buy rate because it was something creative. And it was what we call a cinematic match. It was one of the first of its kind where you're basically making a movie. But you're making a movie in like nine hours. It's not like, you know, nine <laughs> weeks that other movies have. And people really enjoyed this. They needed, uh, they needed to put a smile on their face a, a year ago. And we gave them a super entertaining, unique uh, uh, match that was, like I said, kind of almost a movie. To the point now that here we are, you know, a year later, and that has become one of our calling cards in the AW, the stadium stampede. So uh, it's people kind of know what to expect. It's going to be different than last year's because there's a different dynamic between the inner circle of pinnacles, much more of a blood feud, more violent, much more of an action movie, where last year was almost more of a comedy at times. But it fits, and it's one of AEW's calling cards, like I said, and people are very excited about it. So it's going to be another one of those really cool uh, home run uh, cinematic matches that we have put a lot of time and creative creativity into. And like I said, like you mentioned, it's another reason why AEW stands out is yeah, for a match like this, where people know, okay, we know what to expect with this, but what are they going to do this year to top last year? Well, that's what Chris. That's what I wanted to ask you. I don't mean to cut you off. Is how do you oh, top fun. it? How does he? How do you top it from you know as as uh, as celebrated as what the match was a, le- a year ago? As you mentioned, a little bit of a different uh, variant to it, which a little bit yeah. more kind of a a blood feud with this one. But how do you top it? Do you feel the pressure to try and top this match this year? I think so, but because it's a different story that we're telling, like I mentioned, a different dynamic. Um, you know, when we did the first Elimination Chamber in Madison Square Garden back in 2002 in WWE, I think afterwards people were like, well, that was great, but how could you ever top that? And here we are, you know, in 2020, there's probably been 30 Elimination Chamber matches since then. It's just what you do. You make the first one. Can we make this good? Is it going to be a success? Well, yes, it is. Well, then the tried and true tradition, if it made money, it was a success. Well, let's do it again. You put some different characters in there, some different guys, a different storyline, and some of the di- dynamic changes to where, okay, I think we can top this in a different way. Uh, if there's a stadium stampede three next year, I don't envy the guys that are in it to have to top the first two. But it's kind of what we do in this business, especially in AEW, when you set the gauntlet down and throw the glove down, all right, all that, man. And I think you get a new group of guys with a new creative aspect to them, and, and suddenly – you have a whole different, uh, a whole different vibe for the match. It's just successful, just as exciting. So uh, we're looking forward to it. It's going to be fun. A Sunday night, uh, a double or nothing pay per view. The Stadium Stampede match, packed house down there in Jacksonville. Chris, two more before I let you go quickly here. You're a big hockey guy. Dad played for the Rangers. What are, are you into? These Stanley Cup playoffs so far? Excited for the Jets, man. I mean, uh, our poor Winnipeg Jets were destroyed by the Oilers in the '80s. If it wasn't for Gretzky and his, and his team, I think the Jets would have been Stanley Cup contenders multiple years. So whenever they can beat the Oilers and move forward into round two, I'm all for it. So it's exciting on that aspect for sure right out of the gate. Well, how about beating Connor McDavid? I mean, I mean, you have not only the Oilers, but I mean, Dreisaitl, McDavid, McDavid, arguably the best hockey player in the world right now. And not only yeah. did you, you just, I mean, you embarrassed the Oilers, did the Jets in the opening round, Chris. But here's the thing. Is he the greatest hockey player in the world when he barely ever gets out of the first round? That's he's a good modern day Eric. He's a modern-day Eric Lindros. <laughs> he's a great player, but when it, when it comes to the playoffs, he can't get out of the first round. So I'm not I'm not a McDavid uh, disciple, and I'm, uh, like I said, it was, a, it was a, a shock. But was it a shock? I predicted from day one that the Jets would make it to the Final Four because of the Canadian division, and I still feel that way. So... We shall see what happens, but I think the Jets are a very underrated team. And don't forget, it wasn't two, three years ago they made it to the Final Four uh, against Vegas. So I think there's a lot more to come for the Jets, and I'm excited, uh, as you can tell. So uh, hopefully uh, they'll make it further. Well, uh, hopefully they do, Chris. Uh, last one for you. Uh, fans back in attendance, right? We've been talking a lot about, you know, chants at, 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 at arenas, right? Madison Square Garden was great Sunday and Wednesday night with the Knicks back in the playoffs. We know wrestling fans are very, very creative. What's the most creative chant that you've ever heard at one of your matches that you could stay on radio, Chris? <laughs> it's funny. Like, we just had one. I mean, people just latch on to, to anything that, that they can. You know what I mean? Like, it, it, you could be at a show and just mention something ridiculous and people will start chanting it. Um, I remember I was in Los Angeles at the Staples Center, and I was there was a bad guy at the time, and I was doing a promo kind of you know burying the crowd, and somebody threw a, a toilet paper roll 
at my head and it hit me right in the head. You couldn't have, you couldn't have planned it better. Like the guy should be, you know, pitching for the, for the Yankees or something. And when uh, it hit me in the head, I just looked at it and I was like, who threw that toilet paper roll? And, and there's somebody who's toilet paper, clap, 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 <laughs> toilet paper. And it just kept going. And it was one of these things where like, this is hilarious because once again, like I said, as, as a pro, you just want the fans to react and have fun. So when they're doing a massive, you know, 10,000 person toilet paper chant, it's like, all right, that's a good day at the office. <laughs> well, Chris, it's going to be a great pay-per-view on Sunday night. We're looking forward to it. Third annual Double or Nothing pay-per-view, AEW. Check it out. Go get it. Stadium Stampede match include, uh, involving Chris, uh, an absolute wrestling legend and icon. Hey, Chris, we appreciate it. Good luck in the pay-per-view and in, in the Stadium Stampede match, and uh, and have a good holiday weekend. All right, Chris? Thank you so much. Looking forward to coming back to New York again soon. Appreciate hey. it. 